All right, well, have you ever found yourself asking for a miracle? Have you ever asked, Lord, I need a miracle? Uh, maybe, maybe you're at a point of desperation. You feel like life is just crumbling all around you. You're exhausted. You feel stuck. You feel discouraged. Maybe you're in pain and you're in fear and you're in worry. And it just feels like there's a giant mountain blocking your path to where you think you need to go. And you're saying, I don't know how to get around this. Lord, I need a miracle. I feel stuck. Well, for you today, I want you to hear Jesus heals, that Jesus actually heals, and that at his deepest being, he wants to heal, that Jesus does do this. Psalm 147 says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Matthew 9 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Whew. Jesus is preaching the good news and healing every disease and sickness. And so today we're going to look at two stories, or you just heard about these two stories, that are thinly connected by the sheer fact that Jesus is, is doing this miraculous work of healing. And in these two stories, it presents this complex relationship between Jesus' miracles and saving faith. And so what we're going to do to look at this, we're going to look at this passage in three ways. We're going to see who Jesus heals, we're going to see how he heals, and then we're going to look at what does that mean for us today. So who Jesus heals, how Jesus heals, and lastly, what that means for us today. So who does Jesus heal? Who, 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 do, who gets this magical healing? Who gets this supernatural penicillin uh, from Jesus? Um, that's what we're going to be looking at. And the first person we hear this about is the official's son. And so the official, this, this, this high-ranking official is coming to Jesus and he's bringing his son. We don't know how old he is, but he's bringing his son to Jesus who seems like he's on the brink of death and now, so just imagine if you're a parent that you, you're holding your four-year-old in your arms, maybe limp, almost lifeless. Would you be a little hysterical at this moment? Coming to Jesus, heal my son, heal my son. I need your help. I need your super, supernatural intervention. And in verse 48, Jesus responds, unless you people, he's not going there, by the way, see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Can you help my son? Unless you people believe signs and wonders, you will, see signs and wonders, you will never believe. And you're like, gosh. And so it seems like that's the, the royal official's response. In verse 49, he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. There's like a desperation with this official. And Jesus hears it, and it sounds like he's a little calloused. Sounds like Jesus is a little cold to the official. Almost rude to the official. Unless you see signs and wonders, you people won't believe. Like, reluctant to do this. Why does Jesus say this? I think one of the things we need to remember is we, we want to put our context and our culture on that time. And so we hear a phrase like, you people, we hear phrases like this and we're going like, ah, Jesus. He's just be dismissively being rude to these people. But what we know about Jesus is that he is always answering in love. His answer is always in love. And so remember the, the beginning of this passage. In, in verse 44, it says, No prophet has honor in his hometown, which sounds out of place with this passage. Uh, this passage is, it begins contrasting the reception that Jesus got from the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan people from the Galilean people. In saying, no prophet has honor except in his hometown of the Galileans. And we come to the Galileans, and it doesn't seem like there's an outright rejection. What does it say? Verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Doesn't sound like an outright rejection, but here's what's happening. The Galileans saw that he did miracles. They saw that he could do miracles. They're like, oh, cool. David Blaine's coming to town. Like, awesome, that's neat. But they don't know who Jesus actually is. 
They think he is Dumbledore and he can do some miraculous signs and we're going, let's come for a, for a viewing. But they don't know who Jesus is. All they knew of Jesus is that he is a conduit of magical power. And if that's all Jesus is, then they do not have any faith in Jesus. And Jesus is reading that rightly. And so Jesus not only wants to heal them physically, he wants to heal them in their town spiritually as well. That is the heart of Jesus. And so one thing we learn early on from Jesus is that miracles aren't the point. Jesus is. Miracles aren't the point, but Jesus is. I mean, Jesus doesn't answer every prayer for healing in the Gospels. He doesn't actually heal every sick person in Galilee. He just heals this particular child at this particular time as a sign pointing to something greater. And so what, what good is it for Jesus to heal this person this one time if the whole town is doomed to eternal hell? This is what is going through Jesus' mind. Now, I want to be very careful as I say this in this concept right here, because there are some circles of Christianity that elevate healing to be only about spiritual healing. And they might point to this very passage and say, this is all Jesus wants to do is heal you spiritually, because Jesus is primarily concerned with the redemption of the people in their whole selves, body and soul. Meaning, he cares too much about you to let you just get a massage when you need a chiropractor to reset you, right? <laughs> the, the issues run deeper, right? So Jesus is about that. He, he is, that this is all true. But <laughs> let's be crystal clear. Jesus still heals these people, right? He still has com genuine compassion for the actual pain that they're going through, not just their spiritual conversion. He cares about both. He still heals. He is a healer, and he cares about it all. This seems to be the role that Jesus's miracles play throughout the Gospels, that his miracles, his, his healings here are, are not a product of our faith, that you don't, you don't earn this healing by, by showing so much faith that then Jesus says, great, now I'll heal you, as if he's like a, a vending machine. You don't earn that, fee, that, that, that healing, nor are these miracles the foundation of our faith, that we put our hope in what he's done right here. No, the healings are a catalyst for faith. They give us something to, to, to push us forward in, in our belief. They aren't the point, but they direct us to the point. Does that make sense? They aren't the point, but they direct us to the point, and the point is Jesus. It's crystal clear. And so who does Jesus heal? First, we see that he heals the official's son. And so then the question then begs, so is it only for officials and, and important people? If, you, if your daddy uh, was, a, was a somebody... And so is Jesus only going after someone, uh, the people who will be part of God's, you know, God's squad that can really help advance his kingdom? No. <laughs> Chapter 5 debunks that myth real quick. Chapter 5 introduces us to a person who was physically disabled for 38 years. 38 years. They've been coming to this pool called Bethsaida. And this now creates a theme for Jesus. If we start zooming out and seeing who Jesus is healing. Last week, he came and he healed the Samaritan woman. He spoke to the woman that no, one, no other Jew would be speaking to, right? Then he heals this boy, this child. And now he's healing someone who has been physically disabled. You see the trend here that Jesus is coming for the most vulnerable. <laughs> Funny how that works, <laughs> right? This is who Jesus is going for. And so this text actually uses this word here. It uses a word that refers to him as an invalid. And we, see, we hear invalid, and I think Jade even pronounced it that way, invalid. And <laughs> that's our first thought. <laughs> it was my fault. I didn't ask her to, to read until this morning. <laughs> it, seem, it seems like a rough term to use to refer to someone. When we hear invalid, we're like, are we saying that they are invalid? But that's not what that means. That word translated means weak. It means someone with chronic pain or with a disability. In fact, because of what the theme of what we're seeing of who Jesus heals, it, you could almost say that these are the most valid people. These are the people Jesus is going after. He is, he is zeroing in on these people. And so there, this is who Jesus is coming for. And so don't you ever, ever, ever look down on someone's disability. 
right? This is, this is basic 101 stuff. Okay, but then the skeptics hear about this text. Um, they, they say, this is kind of a ridiculous text. There is no pool with five colonnades or five decks. That's, that's not, that doesn't happen in, in the ancient times here uh, for, for these decks for people to lay out on. But as you would have it, archaeologists unearth this very, this very pool at this very location, at the Sheep Gate, this exact location, with this photo, which looks pretty rough to see because it's ruins, that's what we're looking at, <laughs> but there are five decks, and at this, at this pool, the waters would bubble up, and the, the, the thought was that the, an angel of the Lord came and made the waters bubble up, and if you got in, then you had to receive this supernatural healing. It could be a natural pool that every now and then waters bubble up and there was this this dispensing of iron salts and there was some healing that happened there. We don't know what it was. But the thought was that if you got in the pool in time, then you could get healed. And so if you can't walk, dip into the waters. If you can't see, soak in the magical powers of this watering hole. But now you have this man who's been laying next to the pool for 38 years, who can't get in the pool in time because others jump ahead of line to get in the pool in front of him for 38 years. So you've got to imagine that this man is probably a little salty, probably doesn't like humanity right now. He's maybe a little bit bitter. And so when Jesus comes to him, Jesus asks him this question, though. He says, do you want to be healed? N.T. Wright, a biblical scholar, says the the emphasis should be on the word want. Do you really want to be healed? Or are you just happy to eke out your days here on earth? And so we don't know why he, why he, he has been in this, why he hasn't made himself into the pool, or whether the pool was able to, to actually change him. But Jesus is asking him this hard question, and the man says, absolutely, he wants to be healed. And so then Jesus has compassion on this man who, it seems like, despite a lack of faith, heals this man, and now we're, it's, it feels like we're ripe for another Samaritan situation, where he then goes back to his people, and he tells them all about what Jesus did, and the whole town believes, and there's this mass revival. But the exact opposite happens. This story takes a hard left after he is healed. The man becomes actually the the community's focal point for their disbelief. The established religious leaders hear that Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, and they begin to quibble over the fact that he healed the man on the Sabbath, and they question him, who did this to you? And the man rats Jesus out. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You've been, you've been, disabled for 38 years, you've just been healed, and then you rat the guy out that healed you. So Jesus healed him physically, but, but it didn't, go down, didn't penetrate his soul. And so what's fascinating, to put these two images right next to one another, is to ask the question, who does Jesus heal? He heals one who is seeking and begging, and he heals one who's not desperate at all. Isn't that interesting? He heals one who has barely any faith, but, but, is, but is hanging on to Jesus, and he hears an, an old crotchety cynic. And so one thing we learn is that Jesus doesn't heal people based on what they will do for him spiritually or do for the community. He just heals believers and unbelievers alike. It's just common grace. Jesus just gives healing. And so first, who does he heal? Believers and unbelievers alike. Second, how does he heal? And the answer to that question, how does, how does Jesus heal, is just crystal clear from both passages. How does he heal? He heals by his word. He just says it. He just speaks it into being. The first guy, remember, he's begging Jesus to heal his son, 49, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus just says, go. Go. Jesus replied, your son will live. Now, now we know how powerful Jesus is. And we go, of course, Jesus can do that. But they don't know who he is right now. They think he's maybe a magician, maybe he has some magical healing powers. But 
even if he was a prophet like Elijah, who did some healings miraculously as well, even Elijah needed to be able to have that proximity to the person to lay hands on them, to, to be over them, to that proximity to heal them. This was something they had never seen before. They, 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 Jesus just says, go. You've got to imagine the doubt when, in everyone's mind when Jesus says that, like, the kid's miles away. Did he, is he healed? I don't know about that. And so on one hand, you've got to imagine that doubt because no one, no one has that type of power. That's godlike. that his word is his deed. You know, we, we say, let there be light. Then we have to like go turn on the light, right? <laughs> God says, let there be light and supernovas explode into being. He speaks and it, and it happens. Or, or in the second story in chapter five, verse eight, he says, get up, pick up your mat and go. And the, the man who's been disabled for 38 years just gets up picks up his mat, and he goes. Like, that would be freaky power to these people, that his word does the healing. No one had ever seen power like this. No one has that godlike power. And so the first man, he believes, though. In v- verse 50, it goes on, the man took Jesus at his word. Ooh. <laughs> if Jesus says, your son who you're in tears begging Jesus to heal, and he says, go, he's healed, Instead of hanging on to Jesus' word, I might be hanging on to Jesus and saying, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're coming with me. <laughs> like, that is, that is amazing that he has that type of belief in Jesus, that he hung, hangs on to his word like that. I mean, th- this, this man truly trusts Jesus. I mean, do you guys know that there is a difference between belief and saving faith? Like, there's a difference between just a mere head nod an ascent, and actually saving faith. I mean, even, even the demons believe, we're told. And so that there's got to be more to it than just belief. There's got to be something different, this saving faith. What is that? There's, there's this great story about this, this man named Blondin who was a, a tightrope walker. He was a tightrope walker, and he did all these, these, these amazing feats over Paris, um, and these, these high rises, right? Like he did these, these tremendously scary feats where he would, he, would ha- he would put the rope across these buildings and he would go across and then he said, let's, let's amp it up and let's make this even more interesting for all the onlookers. I'm gonna do this blindfolded. And so then he would walk across this tightrope, crazy high blindfolded. And then he said, let's, let's make it more interesting. I'm gonna get a wheelbarrow and I'm gonna push a wheelbarrow across a tightrope blindfolded. And so the, the, the story spread out of, of what he was doing. And so then there's some people in America who, said, who wrote him a letter and said, tightrope walker, I don't know what you're saying or what you're, what you're trying to, to, to push, but I don't believe it. But I'll be willing to, to bring you to America and to pay you an enormous sum of money if you can do that over the Niagara Falls. Ooh. <laughs> and so... The tightrope walker writes back kind of casually, and he just says, I've never been to America. <laughs> well, I could do that. I could, I could come out and just see what it's like. And so after this, all this promotion, there are hundreds of people at this event. There are hundreds and hundreds of people at this event. And you could just, just try to imagine the buzz that's in the air at this moment. Like the Niagara Falls, <laughs> with how loud the water is, is just banging down. And all of these people here, and they string a tightrope across it from Canada to America. And he starts on the Canadian side, and he's walking across it. So he gets up on the, on the tightrope. He puts his blindfold on. He puts the wheelbarrow on. And then they have one of those, those old school drums. And the drums just, right? And so he starts walking across. He gets halfway all the way. He gets across and the, it just, the, the masses just go wild. It's a frenzy. They're like, this is ridiculous. Like, just imagine the fear, <laughs> the buzz in that, in that area, like for him, but also for the people there. Like, what happens if he falls? What are we doing? Right? 
They, it was an intense moment, but he gets across, and they, there's just sheer jubilee. Everyone is loving it, and so he goes directly to that American promoter who said, I don't believe you can do it, and he comes up to him, and he said, well, now do you believe I can do it? I mean, that's like the ultimate, like, what you got? <laughs> He's like, now do you believe I can do it? And the guy's like, of course. That was amazing. I just saw you do it, and he goes, no, no, no. Do you believe me? And he goes, no, I just saw you do it. Of course I believe you, and he says it a third time. No. Do you believe me that I can do it? And then the American promoter said, yes, I believe you. And so then Blondin, the tightrope walker, says, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. We're going to go across the other side. <laughs> would, you, would you get in? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> Do we have that type of faith in Jesus? That we would believe him. That we would actually believe him more than a head nod of saying, yeah, I believe Jesus. More than just a mere assent. But we, we actually hang on to his every word. We actually believe it. It's life or death and we believe it. Do we live by it? Are we hanging on it? The, for the Greek word of, of belief is to live by and we, we think belief just means, I'm not going to poke holes in it. No, it's, are you going to live by this? That is saving faith, taking Jesus at his words. And so just how often do we as Christians say, yes, I believe, but we're not willing to get into the wheelbarrow, maybe not across Niagara, <laughs> but into eternity, are we actually putting our hope and faith in him? Do we truly believe it? The first guy is told, your son is healed, and he trusts Jesus at his word because he trusts the Savior of the world. He lives on his word. And so Jesus heals. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus actually has the power to heal you? Mosaic, he, believe, he, he is a healer, and he heals by the power of his word. He heals us physically. He can. He also heals us from sin. He heals shame. He heals past evils. He heals us holistically. That's who he is at his deepest. Well, what are the implications of Jesus being healer? Well, the first one, I think, is just what we just talked about, get in the wheelbarrow, <laughs> to actually believe. But I think the second one is the most logical next question, and some of you guys maybe have already been having that percolating, even as I'm talking. If Jesus has the power to heal like this, the logical next question is, then why doesn't Jesus heal us all? Why is he not healing us all? He can cure a child cancer patient. He can heal the stroke victim. He can restore life to a heart that stopped beating. Then why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he do it? I mean, what do we do with that type, these types of real questions? And many of us have already been secretly asking, if God has the power with just the word to say, go, and the son is healed, that almost makes me angrier because of how easy it is for God to heal. And if it's that easy, then why doesn't he do it if that's all it takes? There's a wonderful book that I read last week by a woman named Kate Baller. It says, Everything happens for a reason and other lies that I've loved. The title alone just makes you go, oh. she's a cancer patient. She's a Christian who truly believes in, in, in the God of the Bible. She believes in Romans to be true. She even believes Romans 8.28, which is the, the, the Christian duct tape uh, that I think we always want to give to people whenever they're suffering. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Fantastic verse, overused. <laughs> she believes this. And yet, here's what she says. Paul worshiped God with every breath, right up until his body was dumped in an unmarked grave. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> right? 
We, we don't, we don't want to think about what happens at the end of those stories. We just think about what the, the, the happy times. That God believes, that Paul believes God, and then he's, he's murdered, and then he is killed. And so what is she saying? Kate is, has actually studied the history of the prosperity gospel. And, and there's so many in our churches who would, today, I mean, now, we would distance ourselves from that. We would go, yeah, that's, that's, that's wrong, that's, that's foul. Like, we would not be, want to be part of anything that says, like, uh, let's, God wants you to be rich, and so let's all go after as much money as possible. Let's health and wealth gospel. We, we would try to distance ourselves from, like, Mosaic needs its own private jet. Um, you know, that's just terrible. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's easy to critique, right? Anyone wants to donate one? <laughs> but what's not so obvious, that's obvious, what's not so obvious is when you have a plan for your life, and you said, I've not done anything wrong. I've not committed any homicides yet. I don't have an evil secret plan to eat people. Like, I'm not that type of person, but still my life doesn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And so the modern prosperity gospel, yes, there is still some of that today, but the modern prosperity gospel, I think many of us, even in our circles that we run in, we end up, we end up flirting with and saying things like, man, you're just so blessed. Blessed. Or you found favor with the Lord. You just found favor. You're blessed. These, these terms, these, not bad terms, but usually those are, are typically tied to how much faith that you have in the Lord. And so how much faith do you have? And then you get blessed. How much faith do you have? Then you're, you found favor with the Lord. And so maybe, maybe, maybe you say it this way. Someone, someone has brought you in and said, you, you just need to have enough faith and just say the word. Say money. And money it will be financially yours for all eternity. Say it. Say deliverance. And you are delivered. Have you been a part of these things? Name it and claim it. Right? This is the modern prosperity gospel. But what if the things that you are naming aren't money? Because that doesn't sound right to name it. But maybe it's just pregnant. And you can't get there. What if it's just, please don't be cancer? And it is. At these crucial, critical moments, what do we believe about God then? Those are the hard moments. There are certain things in our life that are just, that we, that just happen, that are just evil and wrong, like the death of a child or the pain of what you're going through right now. There are things that are terminal, that are incurable, that are lifelong and chronic. And I don't know why God doesn't heal everything. I want him to. Sometimes the answer is no. I think there's a value in saying from dust we come to dust we return. Because we start to remember that our lives here are temporary. That our doctors are just delaying the inevitable. But that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't a healing God. He still heals, and some of you guys can testify to this, that he's healed you, and you can tell of what he's done. He, Jesus does heal, and whether he heals you now of this temporary issue or not, he is still a healer, and I pray that he does heal you, and we should still be praying for this. Clearly, he's able to do it. He does it to these two people with the power of his word, and so come to him and beg for healing. I think this should, this should move us from our mundane prayers, saying whether it's your will or not. <laughs> beg, <laughs> beg, wrestle for that healing. Like Jacob wrestled with the Lord, beg for these healings. I mean, James tells us that with, if anyone's sick, we should have the elders come together, lay hands on them and beg for healing. We want that to happen. But even if the answer is temporarily no, we know that he will heal ultimately. He will heal every single man, woman, and child ultimately in the world to come. When there will be no more mourning, when there will be no more aches and no more heartaches, when my knees and my shoulder won't hurt anymore, when our hearts won't break, in that day, in that day, we won't, we have so many doctors here, we won't need you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> you are out of a job in heaven because we won't have to text you and say, is this malignant? <laughs> oh. I'm going to be out of a job in heaven. It's going to be wonderful because we will all know the Lord. 
We will be face to face with him. We'll be fully healed and fully restored. Oh, it's, oh haste the day, Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh. But even, even as we wait for that day, there, there's, there's still the, this tension. And we, we, we heard it a little bit here in verse 14. There's this tension of wondering, is the pain here because of me? Jesus tells this man, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And it, it feels like a threat. It almost feels like Jesus is saying, the reason you're disabled is because of your sin. And you go, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like Jesus. And it almost sounds like the dark side of the prosperity gospel. That if you're good, you get blessed. But if you're not, then you suffer. And it's only because of your sin. And that's what Job's friends told him. That, oh, did you do something to cause this suffering on you? What did you do? What did you, I mean, that, that is not what Jesus is talking about right here. He is still caring and loving this man deeply. Because in the Gospel of John, sin is defined as unbelief. Sin at its root is unbelief. And the more we sin, the more we are dabbling with unbelief. And the more we kind of, we, we keep doing this, we keep not believing. Over time, it proves that you never believed at all. And so what Jesus is saying is saying, if you keep on sinning and keep not believing, something far worse may happen to you. We don't want that for you. And so we, we, we never fully realize the dulling and destructive effects of our sin here on earth. We never do. Sometimes we can get a picture of it, how it impacts the people around us, but we never get how dulling and destructive it is on us ourselves, on our, on our spiritual psyche, but also on our bodies and our minds. We don't understand how, how destructive it actually is. And so Jesus is saying, do you want to be healed? Come to him today. Come to Jesus today, get in the wheelbarrow. And so three quick applications for you today. Place your hope and trust fully in Jesus. Get in the wheelbarrow. Two, reject the false choice between caring for people's physical needs or their spiritual needs because Jesus cares about both. Lastly, realize your hope isn't in the strength of your faith, but it's in the object of your faith. Let me say that again. Make sure we get that. Your hope isn't in the strength of your faith, but it's in the object of your faith. So what we're trying to say is that even a weak, feeble faith in a strong God will do. Say it this way. If, if I saw a chair right here, and the question was, will this chair hold me or not? Is the strength of the chair based on whether I believe it's going to hold me or not? Absolutely not. The, sh the chair stands or falls, whether it's a good and strong chair and maybe my weight. That's always a question mark. <laughs> but if it's a strong chair, if it's been built right, if it's faithful and it's true, then I can sit in it and it will hold up, whether I believe that it's going to hold it or not. I just need just enough faith to sit in it. And so I'm asking you this morning... <laughs> to have just enough faith to believe, to get in that chair that will take you all the way to eternity. Because that, who you're putting your faith in, that object that you're putting your faith in is faithful. It is true. It is a mighty fortress. It is the rock of our salvation. And you can't break that. So put your faith, put your hope in him. Put your faith in the one who defied the grave, who plucked the, the stinger from death, and who gives ultimate healing. Let's pray.